The spiritual tradition of the ancient Taino people was intricate and complex. In many ways, this complexity was extremely similar to that of the spirituality of indigenous people still living in certain regions of South America, where the ancestors of the Taino originated. Modern contemporary South American natives in the Orinoco River region and in other tropical areas of Venezuela and Guyana express spiritual manifestations that exhibit uncanny parallels with what we know of the 15th century traditions of the original people of the Caribbean. There are some aspects of that ancient Caribbean tradition which have survived to the present day in spite of the fact that much of the culture was destroyed by the Spanish conquerors. But the majority of what we know concerning those 15th century indigenous folkways of the Caribbean has been passed to us thanks to the effort of one man. Ironically, the man who managed to salvage a great deal of what we know of ancient Taino culture was himself a Spanish colonizer. His name was Ramon Pané, and he was, in fact, a Spanish Catholic monk who was given the order to live with the Taino for a certain period of time and learn their ways and their spirituality. Pané was given that order by Christopher Columbus himself. He wrote a manuscript now known by the name Narrative Concerning the Antiquities of the Indians. This brief narrative contains a wealth of valuable information about the beliefs and traditions of the ancient Tainos that Pané managed to collect straight from the lips of the Tainos themselves, with whom he stayed for several years on the island now shared by the nations of Dominican Republic and Haiti. Pané's manuscript included the names of important Taino divinities such as Yokahu and Atabe. It included descriptions of how the ancient Tainos prayed and how they practiced their healing traditions. Since this narration was deciphered, researchers have been able to make useful comparisons between the information found in its pages and the traditions of contemporary native people in other parts of the Caribbean and in parts of South America where people still live who are distantly related to the Tainos, such as the Arawak and Loconos and Wapishanas. One researcher who has been recognized as a leading expert on the study of the comparisons between the Taino culture described in Ramon Pane's text and the contemporary indigenous folkways is the Boricua scholar Sebastian Robiu Lamarche. This researcher has taken the confused concepts found in Ramon Pane's narrative and he has made remarkable discoveries based on intensive comparison with other native cultures, as well as careful investigation of indigenous astronomical data from related tribes that was missed by other scholars. Robula March has written extensively on these subjects, and his books are considered the definitive conclusion on what we know of Taino cosmology. He published an important work in the 1980s called Encuentro con la Mitología Taína, Encounter with Taino Mythology. In this book, he laid out Taino's sacred narrative as it is expounded in Panay's manuscript in a systematic and orderly manner that clarifies it and makes it easier for the reader to feel its depth and its integrity. In this book, Robiula March broke down the Taino sacred narrative of creation tale into three separate but related cycles. Each cycle expounds a different set of important Taino spiritual concepts, and together, the whole construct creates a coherent and practical compendium that not only coincides and harmonizes with the tradition of related indigenous people in nearby areas, but also can actually be interpreted as practical lifeways that we modern Tainos can easily combine with our own family and societal traditions in order to recover much of what was lost in the past 500 years. One of the most significant elements of this book is a wonderful diagram that charts out the patterns of those three narrative cycles and organizes them into an elegant visual design. This diagram is a distinct circular pattern in which the stories that Pané wrote down evolve in an orderly coherent manner and speak clearly to us straight from the lips of our ancient Taino ancestors. We in the Canet Circle have scrutinized Rubio Lamarche's work and understand just how accurate it is. We have compared it 
with what we know of our ancestral legacy and have concluded that it matches in many ways what our ancestors have revealed to us directly. There are a number of points made in Robiola March's book where we have arrived at significantly different conclusions. These differences of opinion are important but do not conflict with the fundamental concepts of understanding. One example of this is the fact that Robiola March considers the narrative character Guajayona to be the first Pejique, whereas we understand him to be the first Cacique. Another point on which we differ from Robiola March is the chronological order of the three narrative cycles pictured in his diagram. These and other differences notwithstanding, the diagram is a masterpiece, and we urge all modern Tainos to become acquainted with it. To understand the circular diagram of Taino cosmology in Robiula March's book, a person must first be very well acquainted with the narrative of Ramon Panay's manuscript. We in the Canay Circle call this narrative the Taino Chronicles. As I mentioned earlier, our interpretation of the Taino Chronicles varies in some respects from the interpretation accepted by Robiula March. As a result of that, we interpret the circular diagram in his book slightly differently from the way that he does. That said, we agree with the vast majority of the book's conceptualization, even with little known concepts that Robiola March has proposed but are not accepted by many other modern day Tainos. One example of this is the fact that Robiola March accurately describes Yokahu and Atabe as equal components of the personality called Yaya. Yaya is the ultimate supreme being identified by Robiola March. The male Yokahu and the female Atabe are the two equal components of Yaya. In other words, Robiula March tells us that Yaya is the supreme being, the great spirit, neither male nor female alone, but a harmonious combination of both. This great spirit is composed of two divine entities, the male Yokahu and the female Atabe. In this respect, Robiula March's conceptualization of the Taino great spirit is completely at odds with the perception of many in the current Taino resurgence movement. Many of these modern-day Tainos believe in a Christian-like male supreme divinity that more closely resembles what they have grown up with in this 21st century culture. Whereas many modern Tainos think that Yokahu is something like a male Christian god, Rubiola March quickly understood that the ancient Taino perception of the supreme divinity is quite a bit more complex than that, and Yokahu is only one half of the supreme being. Now, let us again look at the circular cosmology design in Rubiola March's book. To explore the construction of Rubiola March's circular cosmology design, we would like to start first with an explanation of the Taino Chronicles as we have interpreted them from Ramon Panet's narrative. Once we have fully narrated the Taino Chronicles, we will come back and explain Robiola March's circular design. We now present to you the Taino Chronicles. It begins in the time before time, in the moment before birth, in the realm outside of what can be fully understood by the human mind. The ancestors told us that there was only one thing in the midst of the nothingness, and that thing was her thought that thing was her will, and that thing was her infinite power to be, and to let be. And she manifested herself in the midst of the nothingness, as a mother, a nurturer, as a matriarch, a divine enchantress, and her magic was her chant, and her chant was her rhythm, and her rhythm was cyclical, like the beat of a drum, like the shake of a rattle. Her song was cyclical, like the spin of a wheel, of a spinning vortex, like the turn, the spin of the hurricane wind. Toka 
I will myself pregnant, and from my womb, I give birth to life itself. And the divine belly grew full with the magic of creation, the sacred enchantment of making, of bringing forth. The ancestors, the ancient ones, depicted her in their craft, in their sacred art. She was the mother of the full womb. She, from whose sacred uterus flows forth life itself. Then came the time of making, of creating, then the powerful vibration, the cyclical rhythm, brought forth fruit, and the cosmic belly, the fertile birthplace, awoke with a new presence. To complete the process of cosmic birth, the sacred spirit mother appealed to the energy of one of her spirit animals. She assumed the shape of the infinitely fertile frog mother, she of the thousand eggs, she of the ten thousand eggs. This powerful magic of fertility was all that the cosmic matriarch needed. And in her belly was manifested new life in the form of the sacred twins. The cosmic mother's womb is the sacred womb, the ultimate womb deep in the very center of all existence. It is the oval place, the place of the coiled snake, the place of the stone hoop, koabai, where souls await the moment of rebirth. There, in that oval place, the essence of life attached itself to the wall of the cosmic uterus, and the cosmic conception became complete. The cosmic mother was with child. Twin boys they were, one of them the warrior spirit Guacar, the stern teacher, the lord of experience, from whose harsh lessons all humans learn and grow strong and tough. And the other twin son was Yokahu Bagua Marokoti, the fatherless one, the radiant sun spirit, the spirit of light, the spirit of life, the spirit of energy. These two are her children then, they who were birthed through the power of the frog magic, the divine twins, Yokahu, the spirit of life, and Guacar, the spirit of wisdom. And the mother's name is Atabe, the great ancestress, the water mother, the earth mother, she of the serpent womb, she who gives and takes away life. And now Yokahu stands side by side with Atabe in the process of creation. Now the process of creation has reached a new and higher level in the vast void of the nothingness there is now a divine couple standing side by side prepared to carry out the sacred magic act of making of producing the divine male and the divine female link hands and commence the process of Genesis the cosmos is filled with the green magic of fertility and this magic is the vehicle through which the divine couple prepared to bring forth the great miracle of making, of creating. Then the magic moment of union arrives. The primordial female, Atabe, and the primordial male, Yokahu, unite and divine love manifests in divine conjunction. The two ancient symbols of the female oval and the male circle are united to create a new symbol and this new symbol becomes the manifestation of cosmic consummation in the midst of the fertile greenness. Once the sacred act of creative union was consummated, Yokahu stood by the cosmic mother as her belly again grew with the promise of new birth, new begetting. Again the primordial matriarch assumed the position of divine birth magic. It was the frog mother, the fertility avatar. The sacred opening to her womb became manifested in the form of a mystical cave mouth. From that cave mouth would emerge all of creation. 
First, with the aid of Yokahu, the mother Atabe gave birth to the twin great celestial lights, the sun and the moon. The ancient ancestors imaged these sacred heavenly entities in their shamanic pictographs and petroglyphs. The son of Hayuya in Boriken eventually came to symbolize the ancestors' veneration of solar magic. The cave pictographs of linked twin circles, one centrally dotted and the other one blank in central Cuba, were the image of the duality embodied by the heavenly disks of the sun and the moon. The sun with its brilliant life-giving light, the moon with its cyclical periods of fertility. The sacred cave opening to the womb of the Cosmic Mother from which the sun and the moon emerged was called Iguanaboina. Then the process of creation resumed. The Great Mother bore down on the effort of divine birth and from her womb emerged four sacred stones. The four stones were cast up into the sky by Yokahu and each one took its place and became a star in each of the four cardinal positions, south, west, north and east. The star of the south reflects the human quality of open-minded innocence. The star of the west reflects the human quality of introspection, the ability to look within one's own soul. The star of the north reflects the human quality of wisdom and experience. And the star of the east reflects the human quality of illumination, clear vision. The cosmic matriarch Atabe asked her son, the spirit of energy, Yokahu, to position, shape, and form the lights of the sky. Yokahu stirred the fermenting celestial mists and formed the magical cosmic tree of the sky, which is manifested in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is another manifestation of the cosmic mother. Round about the sacred central cosmic Saba tree, of the sky, the stars and galaxies were birthed with explosive vigor. The great sacred celestial Seba tree, the cosmic tree, the great universal axis around which all reality rotates, became manifest at the very heart of creation and established the divine connection between the three mystic realms. Above, the upper sky realm called today. In the middle, the earth plane called Ku. And the lower watery underworld, accessed only through caves and dominated by the primordial ocean, a world that exists in a zone called and above the sun, the sacred manifestation of all energy, arches across the sky marking the cycles of the days, his blessed light bringing the power of solar life down to earth. On the surface of the earth, the green plants like yucca use that radiant energy to synthesize carbohydrates storing the sacred solar light in the form of caloric energy in their tissues. Blessed is the energy-laden light from above, which conveys divine life magic from Yokahu's heavenly realm down to the plant beings, and the act of integrating that radiant magic into their leaves and stems through the process of photosynthesis. The plants such as yucca literally encapsulate the solar power within their tissues, and when these plants are eaten by humans, the solar power becomes integrated in the human body, making of people little particles of the sun, earthbound manifestations of Yokahu. The great mother Atabei and the great father Yokahu looked over the fruit of their labor, creation in all its glory, and they were pleased. Now, the time came to populate the earth with human beings. A new manifestation of the cave opening into Atabei's womb, called Kasibahagwa, became the setting for the origins of people. Kasibahagwa is the conduit to the sacred womb of the Cosmic Mother, a place called Kwaibai. The ancient Taino ancestors imaged that place as being at the center or the heart of all creation. Kwaibai, the sacred womb of the Cosmic Mother, the place from which all life emerges and where all life returns after its cyclical journey on Earth.
The concept of Koibai, the womb of the Cosmic Mother, is a complex one. It includes subterranean imagery of a place deep at the core of the world, underground. It is conceived as a watery place filled with a kind of amniotic humidity where unborn souls in the form of fish await the moment of conception. Through the very center of this watery place rises the base of the world tree, the cosmic center, its trunk throbbing with the heartbeat of life itself. Koibai imagery also includes the form of the Iguera gourd, the fruit of the Iguera tree. This sacred object filled with seeds that promise new life is also a sacred metaphor for Atabe's watery womb filled with potential human souls in the form of fish. And so, it is in this, in this warm, nurturing, uterine environment, represented by the sacred symbolic oval of Atabe, that the first human being was conceived. The womb of Atabe was often imaged by the ancients in the ovoid, pear-shaped form of a human uterus and was associated closely with the totem animal of the Supreme Mother, the serpent. Maha, the sacred boa constrictor, is the holy animal, coiled and represented by the ancients in their stone oval sculptures. Its pear shape reflects the shape of the human womb and indicates the fertility of the cosmic matriarch, a fertility that is magnificently manifested in the 28-day cycle of the moon, the divine menses. The ancients tell us of an archetypal first human, a primordial ancestor, a being that was created in the image and likeness of the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit, called Yayaguaturei, is the balanced combination of the male energy of Yokahu and the female energy of Atabe. This new human, created in the image of the Great Spirit, is given the name of the Great Spirit and called Yayalokuo. Yayalokuo was given the command by the divine couple to multiply and flourish. And so, Yayalokuo opened the belly, and from it fell on the ground some blood. From that blood of Yayalokuo sprang two people, a man and a woman. The man was called Heketiwaribo, first man, and the woman was called Heketiwarishi, first woman. It was in the sacred primordial uterine cave of Kasibahagwa, but the first man and the first woman united in love, reflecting the creative example of the divine male and the divine female. From that love arose the great host of the human race, who came to inhabit and fill the primordial cave. The world outside the cave was not yet ready for human habitation, and the first humans were obliged to remain shut in until such time as it was appropriate to emerge from them. But the wait began to become filled with hardship for the first people. Soon sickness arose in there, and the people suffered. There was need for the healing herbs Digo and Guello, but the people could not go out to get them. The people had a leader. He was the first chief, the first cacique, Guagullona. He gathered some of the bravest and strongest together, and harangued them. The time has come for action, he said. We must maintain vigilance and find out when the outside world is ready for us to go out and search for the healing herbs. Cacique Guagullona first called upon a man called Makokai to stand watch by the entrance of the cave so that it could be determined what portions of the young earth would gradually become fit for human habitation so that people could be sent out to those places first for the herbs and then to live out there. So Makokael assumed his post at the entrance of the cave and promised to be watchful and vigilant, looking out at the endless landscape as one who would never blink but instead keep his eyes forever open as one without eyelids. to keep his post, ever watchful, to eventually determine 
the destiny of the people. But one day there was no watchman at the cave door, no one to keep vigilant as Makokaela had promised. He took too long to report to his place of responsibility. Eventually, after a long time had passed, he finally rushed to his post, but by then it was too late. Makokael was negligent in regard to his job, he was tardy at his post, he failed to report for his duty on time, he was late, his lack of vigilance cost him dearly. His essence was snatched up by the metamorphic power of the sun, his body fossilized, he became nothing but a pile of rocks by the cave entrance. After the loss of Makokael, things got worse among the people of the cave community. Sickness and hunger had established a stranglehold among them and they had no way of alleviating the suffering. They had no healing herbs and the food supply was catastrophically low. The people were dying. Wives lost their husbands. Husbands lost their wives. And mothers lost their children. Again, Cacique Guagullona, the chief, gathered around him those who demonstrated a willingness to help. There were some who volunteered to bravely go out and attempt to fish in the streams and rivers so that the food supply could be replenished. And so off they went into a primordial, not fully formed world. To search for the food that their fellows needed so desperately. The weight of the gold guanine medallion, the emblem of his authority, hung heavily from Guaguyona's neck. The people depended on his leadership for their survival. Guaguyona, as chief, as cacique, owed his authority to the fact that he represented the central axis of existence among his people. Like the very center of the Milky Way galaxy, which the ancients perceived as the trunk of the cosmic axis tree, the celestial Seva tree, Guaguyona provided the anchor around which the lives of his people orbited very much like the millions of stars, planets, and other heavenly bodies that comprise the Milky Way galaxy orbit around the galaxy's center. Those who were chosen by Chief Guaguyona to attempt the food acquisition mission turned out to be very successful at their task. And soon they had a large quantity of the precious food collected in baskets. But instead of returning quickly to share their bounty with their fellows at the cave, they greedily kept the fish to themselves, cooking all of it on barbacoa, a barbecue grill on the riverbank. They felt that if they returned and shared the fish with the crowd in the cave, there would be precious little left for them. Their greed and selfishness got the better of them. They settled down to enjoy the fruit of their labor, greedily devouring all of the fish that they had caught. Unbeknownst to them, the powerful spirit of harsh experience was already at work preparing the tough lesson that would forever mark them as the example 
which generations of descendants would point to and remark. That is what happens when greed and selfishness controls the actions of people. The ancient Taino spirit of harsh experience is Wakar, the twin brother of the Lord of Life, Yukahu. Wakar is the Lord of Trials, the tough disciplinarian and headmaster of the school of hard knocks. Wakar, wielding his Manaya hatchet of destiny, was actually the one responsible for the fate of Makokael, he who failed to keep watch at the entrance of the cave. And now, he would again make these irresponsible ones pay a heavy price for their dereliction of duty. It was again the awesome metamorphic power of the sun that was the active agent in the downfall of the successful fishers. They were smitten by the Manaya hatchet of Wakar, as Makokael had been before them, and their bodies were transformed into trees. When those that he had sent out for fish did not return, Guaguyona found himself even more hard-pressed to solve the crises in the cave. Ultimately, he summoned a man called Yaubaba. He addressed the young man with desperate sincerity. My son, I am entrusting you with a great responsibility. The people are dying. Our hope is waning. Our supplies of healing herbs are severely depleted. Those I trusted earlier have failed us. It is now up to you. Yaubaba understood the gravity of his mission. He needed to venture out into a dangerous, unfinished world and search for the healing herbs Digo and Guello that were needed by those still living in the cave. He also was entrusted with the task of finding out if there was any place for the people to go and live so they could finally abandon their cave home. As it turned out, Yaubaba was just as successful in his quest as those who had gone fishing before him. He managed to gather a huge quantity of the healing herb, Guello. The young man carefully hung rows of the guayo leaves on a rack to dry in the sun, and as they became ready, he ground them in a bowl with a stone mortar. He then mixed the ground herb with water and boiled the mixture to prepare a potent wash. Being afflicted with the same sickness that was tormenting many back in the cave, he bathed with the wash and soon found complete relief from the illness. At that point, he should have immediately returned to his people and shared his good fortune with them. But like the fishers before him, he balked at sharing the precious medicine, fearing that the others would not leave enough for his own personal needs. He kept all of it for himself and never returned to the cave. Of course, that was Yahubaba's fatal mistake. He suffered the same fate that had taken down Makokael and later those who had been sent for fish before him. Wakar, the lord of harsh experience, brought the full weight of his dreadful manaya down upon his head, and through the transformative energy of the sun, Yahubaba was turned into Yahubabayael, a mockingbird. After Yaubaba failed to return with the healing herbs, Guajayona became extremely irate. No one seemed to pay attention to his orders. He felt that the members of the community as a whole had lost all respect for him, and this made him irrational. 
Eventually, he devised a crazy plan to get back at the whole community. He used his position of authority and influence to persuade every single woman in the cave community to abandon their fathers, brothers, husbands, and even children to leave with him. Well, Hayona committed this inconceivable sin. And as he and the women exited the cave, they left the community in a state of imbalance. This story demonstrates the importance that the ancient Taino placed on the concept of balance and equilibrium, including the balance between the genders, male and female. When the cave community was left without women, the little babies who had not yet been weaned began to cry out for their mother's breast milk. But they writes that they made weeping sounds and called out, Toa, Toa, which he explained meant that they were pleading for the mother's breast. Eventually, these babies turned into little frogs. Sebastián Rubio Lamarch suggests that there's a link between this episode of the story and similar narratives in the legends of related Arawakan tribes in which babies turn into frogs and the frogs are converted into the seven stars of the Pleiades constellation, which in turn is associated with the wet season when the sky weeps tears of rain and frogs emit loud mating calls. Ramon Pané wrote that Guajayona traveled far away with the women, and Rubiola March suggests that this journey was made aboard a canoe. It would have been a very large canoe to be able to accommodate all the women of the tribe. According to the Pané narration, a relative of Guajayona appeared on the scene in the role of cacique chief. His name was Anacacuya, whose name has been interpreted by some scholars to mean flower of the center. Rubio Lamarche's interpretation contends that Anacacuya was the actual chief of the community, with Guajayona playing the role of a future Bejique. But we in the Cane Circle propose that Guajayona was, in fact, the true chief, and Anacacuya was an illegitimate usurper. In any case, Guajayona decided that Anacacuya's presence in the situation was untenable and devised a plan to get rid of him. According to Pané's narration, Guajayona tricked Anacacuya to go out on the water in the canoe to catch fish. When they were at a fair distance from shore, Guajayona pointed excitedly at the water and cried out, Look at that beautiful seashell down there under the water! Anacacuya leaned over the gunwale of the canoe to get a better look at the seashell, and at that point, Guajayona grabbed him suddenly by the legs and tossed him into the ocean. Anacacuya drowned. We in the Kene Circle interpret this episode as the appropriate thing to happen, since Anacacuya was attempting to take advantage of the power vacuum left behind by Guajayona's departure. It would have been disastrous for an illegitimate usurper to take control of the leadership of the tribe, and so he had to be eliminated. In addition to that, we suggest that this episode brought Guajayona back to his senses and demonstrated to him the grave situation that he had created by his inappropriate actions. Rubio Lamarche suggests that at this point, Guajayona continues on the journey in the canoe laden with women, traveling from the cave community in the west to a distant region in the east. As he paddled the canoe, he navigated using the North Star and the associated constellations of the Big and Little Dippers as a guide during the night. Eventually, he arrived on a distant island, and there the women appeared to have rebelled. They seemed to have become ashamed of what they had done, and they abandoned him, pledging never to deal with any man ever again. These women created a man-free community on the island, and it became known by the name Matinino, which some modern scholars have interpreted to mean place without fathers. Soon after that, Alone and in despair, Guajayona became violently ill. Sores appeared on his body, and he attempted without success to heal himself by bathing in rivers and streams. Finally, he discovered a woman that had somehow separated herself from the main group of women and was living alone near a body of water in a place called Juanín. Her name was Guabonito. Guajayona approached that woman and begged her to help him Fortunately, Guabonito was a talented healer, and she secluded Guajayona in what Pané describes as a place apart, as part of the healing procedure. 
Panay wrote that the ancient Taino called this place apart, Aguanara. We in the Canay Circle agree with the conclusion arrived at by the 1960 scholar Eugenio Fernandez Mendez, who suggests that this place apart, this Guanara, is actually a healing sweat lodge, similar to typical sweat lodges called Temascals, that are still abundant to this day in Mexico among the Nahual speaking indigenous people there, and which are usually administered by female healers. Guajayona spent some time in seclusion until he felt better. When he was all healed up, he emerged as if reborn. Guabonito helped him acquire a new name, Albeborael Guajayona. She also took steps to help him recover his position as leader of his community. Rubiola Marge insists that the recovery period was, in fact, an initiation to the position of Bejique, medicine man. But we in the Canay Circle are convinced that Guabonito was actually preparing her patient to resume his old role as Casica chief. She did this by giving him important gifts. She tied magical stones, sibas, to his arms, and more importantly, she gave him objects made of a metal that the ancient Tainos called guanin. This metal has been identified as an alloy of gold by most scholars. Guanin has been recognized as the metal used to make the special medallions that caciques wore as part of their regalia. We feel that this fact supports our contention that when Guabonito regaled Guajayona with gifts, she was initiating him as a cacique and not as a bejique. The fact that Guabonito took on the responsibility of bestowing Guajayona with the accoutrements of chief suggests that she established a tradition of chiefs being anointed by women in the matrifocal culture of the ancient Tainos. It did not take long before Guajayona was ready to return to the cave, a contrite and remorseful leader. He rode his canoe back home alone and without the women. When Guajayona arrived back at his home, he was immediately confronted with the terrible problem of his own creation, the lack of balance in the tribe. There were no women. During the period of time when Guajayona was absent from the cave community, the men had ventured out periodically to a nearby river to bathe. As they were in the water, certain creatures who lived in the forest climbed down from the trees and began to dance and cavort around the perplexed men. These creatures looked like human beings and were actually extremely attractive, like beautiful women, but they lacked gender definition. They were genderless entities who were neither male nor female. They approached the men as these were bathing and frolicked around them alluringly and suggestively. They appeared to be teasing the men who had been without women for a long time. Whenever one of these creatures got close to a man, he would reach out to touch or embrace it, but the creature would then giggle and run away, oftentimes slipping out of the man's arms like a slippery eel sliding out of his grasp. We in the Canet Circle suggest that these creatures lacked ethics and principles. They taunted and teased the man mercilessly because they lacked a human soul. They were amoral. We also believe that if these creatures were endowed with human ethical souls, they could become human and acquire the missing morality. Confronted by this predicament, when he returned to the community, Guajayona conferred with other leading members of the group and arrived at a plan that would resolve several problems at the same time. It would eliminate the annoyance of the teasing and taunting, and at the same time, it would replace the missing women. They proposed to turn the genderless forest creatures into human women with ethics and principles. To carry out this plan, they needed two things. They needed to catch at least four of these creatures, and then they needed to transform their bodies into the bodies of women. With the physical transformation would also come the spiritual transformation. The men found four of their number, 
who were afflicted by a skin condition that the Tainos called Karakaracol. These Karakaracol men had skin so rough that they could wrap their arms around the slippery creatures and keep them from sliding out of their grasp. The next time the forest beings approached the men, the four individuals with the Karakaracol condition captured one of the creatures apiece and held on to them successfully. They tied the creatures to trees to make them look like they were part of the tree trunk. Then the leaders of the community appealed to the spirit of the woodpecker bird, whom the ancient Tainos called Inriri. The Inriri appeared and began to peck at the bodies of the forest creatures tied to the trees. The bird sculpted and carved like a talented woodcrafter. The actions of Inriri caused the forest creatures to take the shape of human women, and at the same time, they acquired human souls and human ethics. They became principled and respectable women. They married the men of the community, and balance was returned to the tribe. Once the community had been brought back to balance, Guhayona finally led them out of Kasibahawa Cave and into the world. The people learned to construct thatched roofed houses and to plant corn, beans, squash, and yucca in their gardens. They established Yucayeke communities. The oldest member of the tribe was Yaya Lokuo, who had been the first human created by the divine couple and who bore the same name as the supreme being, Yaya Goture. Yaya Lokuo and his wife settled in their homestead with their youngest son, Yaya El. Yaya El and Yaya were often at odds with each other. Father and son did not get along. Eventually, their constant quarreling resulted in Yael being banished for four months. Eventually, Yael returned to the homestead, but he and his father got into a terrible physical altercation, and Yael was killed. Yael was heartbroken. He performed the funerary ceremonies for his dead son. He eventually interred the boy's bones inside a large gourd. He hanged the large gourd by long cords from the ceiling rafters of his home. From time to time, Yaya would bring down the gourd from the place where it hung and would set it down and weep over it. Eventually, the magic of the salty, grief-stricken tears filled the inside of the gourd with seawater and the bones turned it into fish swimming around in there. Mullets, tarpons, and snooks. All humanity had already emerged from the sacred cave, Kasibahagwa, the ancestral cave. And the human race, the human species, found itself living upon the surface of the earth. At that time, after the people had emerged from the ancestral cave, there was a woman called Itiba Kaubab, who was the physical human manifestation of Akabe, the cosmic matriarch, here on earth. And she was here on the earth only for a short period of time just long enough to give birth to the ancestors of the Daini. Itiba Kaubaba became pregnant. And from her womb emerged Deminan Karakarakol and his three brothers. These four, four youths were born of the same womb, and so were quadruplets. Then, then Itiba Kaubaba died, and her soul returned again to its place as the cosmic matriarch. The youths, the poor youths, grew, became mature, they matured, and they became 
for young men. But they lacked virtue. They were mischievous, badly behaved, and took advantage of the old people. And so, one day, they approached the boio, the hut of the ancestral figure, Yaya. Yes, they even had the audacity to invade the personal space of the quintessential elder, Yaya Lokuo. This man had the same name as the great spirit because he had similar quality functions as Yaya Guature, the great spirit. So Yaya the man, Yaya the human, at that time was in the fields cultivating his crops, farming, tending to the Coluco. And while he was absent from his bohio, these four young men came into the hut and began to look, look for food. They found it in the uh, burial, the funerary gourd that was hanging from the ceiling of the home. It was hanging from cords. There was this large gourd. That's where the bones of the son of Yaya were interred. Following the tradition of the ancestral Tainos, his remains, the remains of Yayael, Yael, the son of Yaya, were put into a gourd and were hung from the ceiling. The brothers grabbed the gourd and they saw that the bones had turned into fish, swimming around in the salty water inside the gourd. And so they began to eat the fish. They consumed this forbidden food. Then they heard Yaya coming back. Yaya was returning. Frightened, they attempted to rehang the gourd from the ceiling and run away. But the cord slipped, the gourd fell and broke. And from inside it began to flow an unending amount of water. And the, wa the water filled up all the low places and became the Caribbean Sea. So the brothers, the brothers ran away from Yaya, the man. And they came into the hut of another old man, by Yamanaku. medicine man. Bayamanako at the time was doing a sacred ceremony of the Kohoba. He had inhaled powdered seeds, seeds that had been ground into a sacred powder. Kohoba is the hallucinogenic plant seed from a tropical tree. The ancient wisdom keepers and shamans invoked the assistance of this substance to help transport them to mystic zones of the spirit realm. And so, that is what Bayamanako was doing that day when Deminang and his brothers showed up at his bohio. And he was in a moment of trance. Now it is true that when large amounts of kohoba are inhaled, they make a lot of mucus flow from the nose. And so, Mayamanaku would wipe his nose from time to time as he did the ceremony. And then in came these, these disrespectful brothers into his hut 
saying, Hey, grandfather, give us something to eat. Come on, we'll take whatever we want. And they started snatching things from the shelf and from the hanging bags and the hot boxes. Ayamako sat quietly and watched as the disrespectful brothers ransacked his hut. And then, as he felt the accumulation of mucus in his nose, he put his finger up to one nostril and went, Foo! and blew a huge gob of mucus onto the back of Deminan. Deminan was, was indignant. Ugh, you nasty old man. Ugh, ugh, disgusting. Look what you've done to me. You blew that nasty stuff on my back. And just as he said that, he began to feel pain on the spot where the mucus had fallen on his back. Oh, oh, it hurts. It hurts. Oh, oh. His back was burning. There was pain. The, the brothers just began to look at it. What's going on, brother? What is happening, Deminan? This old man has done some witchcraft on my back. It, it's hurting. So the brothers looked. Sure enough, there was a swelling. A large hump was beginning to grow on Deminan's back. They did everything they could to alleviate it, but it just kept growing, and it was hurting. The pain was unbearable. Deminan ran out of the hut, and behind him is three brothers. He was rolling on the ground in pain, squirming, groaning and screaming. Finally, his brothers grabbed a knife and started hacking at the hump. She screamed, ah! And from the cut, they saw mo some movement. They were amazed when the hump began to squirm and move. And from the cut began to emerge a huge turtle. Kawama. The turtle, the female turtle, came out of the hole. You see, that turtle represented an element of human emotion that is called compassion. Yes, the four brothers had repressed this human emotion within themselves. They did not allow compassion to come out. They kept it trapped inside themselves and did not let it manifest itself. And without compassion, they weren't whole humans. Compassion is the female element that lives within all souls, within all hearts. They repressed it. And now, through the sacred magic of Bayamanako, compassion had been liberated. It was growing out. It was birthing out of the back of Benina. The, the scattered personality of Deminan, these four brothers who essentially represented a, a split personality, did not know what this all meant. The turtle crawled out and turned into a beautiful. Then they knew what had to be done. They understood. They saw that it is only through the balance of the male and female elements of humanity, the four, four gifts that these four boys represented, open mind in the South, introspection in the West, wisdom and experience in the north 
illumination in the East. Combined with the female element of compassion of Kagwama, the turtle woman. It is through the union, the marriage of these two, that a balanced humanity can exist. The split personality of the four boys became one. It was one man, now united through the magic of Bayamanako. One man, one whole man, whole man married now to Kaguamo, the compassionate one, the turtle woman. And in unity, they gave birth to a whole nation, Taino, the noble one. Now let's look at Rubio Lamarche's circular cosmogram. The visual pattern is designed to follow the story of the Taino Chronicles. In Rubio Lamarche's original interpretation of the story, he concludes that Ramon Panet made a mistake in the chronology of the events. He figures that the story of Yayael comes before the stories of Guajayona and Deminan. But we in the Canet Circle have concluded that Ramon Panet's chronology is accurate. We feel that the story of Guajayona comes first, and then Yayel, and then finally Deminan. For that reason, we have taken the liberty of reorganizing the rings of Rubio Lamarche's circular design to fit our interpretation of the chronology. Rubio Lamarche's circular design is built around the fundamental pattern of gender duality, with a central circle here colored in yellow. The central circle represents the supreme deity of Taino spiritual belief, called Yaya. The term Yaya is derived from the repetition of the word Ya, which means soul. When the word is repeated, it assumes a superlative meaning, the soul of all souls, or the supreme soul. Rubula March places the name of Yokahu, the supreme male spirit of life and energy, above, representing the sky and the sun. He places the name of Atabe, the supreme female spirit of motherhood and creativity, below, representing the earth and terrestrial waters. Rubiola March describes the ultimate union of this divine male energy from above and this divine female energy from below to conjunct at the very center, establishing the ultimate force of creation. It is from this union that the universe is created. Rubiola March describes Yaya as a hermaphroditic entity confirming its combination of the two genders in one entity, male and female. The most important underpinning element of Rubio Lamarche's circular construct is the harmonious interaction of balanced opposites. He calls this interactive balance dualism. By necessity, dualism requires the interaction of two harmonious opposites. And yet, such well-balanced dualism creates the completion of the whole, and so he sees dualism as necessary for the existence of unity. That is why dualism itself is matched with its harmonious opposite, unity itself. We now move out from the center of the circular construct and encounter a series of concentric rings. The first three rings correspond to the three main stories of the Taino Chronicles. As I mentioned earlier, Rubula March starts with the story of Yayael, but we follow the original chronology of Panay's narrative, and so we start with the cycle of Chief Guagayona. That cycle is followed by the cycle of Yayael, and the third ring corresponds to the cycle of Deminan. The circular construct is designed in such a way so that the stories unfold in a circular pattern, moving in a counterclockwise manner, starting with the inner circle first, then the second from the center, and then finally the third one. We will begin with the innermost ring, the cycle of Guajayona. Since Guajayona, or Guaguyona, is the leader of the community in the cave Casibahagua, this cave is mentioned in the inner ring at the very top. Curiously, Rubila March considers Guajayona to be the first pejique, but as we move around the cycle, the first word that we confront is cacique, which coincides more with our perception of this character as chief. In keeping with Rubio Lamarche's focus 
on harmonious opposites, the energies of the cacique, sun and dryness, at the upper left-hand quadrant, are counterbalanced by the opposing energies of the behique down at the lower right-hand quadrant, which feature the moon and moisture. The harmonious opposing duality of the cacique versus the behique is manifested by the contrast of the cacique's dry golden sun energy standing in harmonious opposition to the behique's moist silver moon energy. These two celestial elements emerge from the sacred cave Iguanaboina, where the twins Boinayel, who is the spirit of rain, and Marohu, who is the spirit of dry weather, live. The next element of Guajayona's cycle is the demise of Makokael, who was turned into stones. The demise of the fish hunters, who were turned into trees. And the demise of Yahubaba, who was turned into a bird. Rubiola March interprets this series of transformations as sacrifices which were necessary for the creation of the three earthly realms, the realm of minerals, represented by Makokael's rocks, the realm of plants, represented by the fisherman's trees, and the realm of animals, represented by Yahubaba's bird. At this point in Guajayona's cycle, we encounter the moment of drama. Rubiola March interprets Guajayona's decision to abscond with all the women of the community as a kind of rebellion. He is rebelling against the norms of Taino society. He is abandoning the community that needs his leadership, and he is causing a catastrophic imbalance in the community by depriving it of its female energy. As we continue to move around the cycle of Guajayona, we arrive at the moment where the babies are crying and finally turn into little frogs. Rubiola March recognizes this episode of the story as a metaphor for the intensifying of the rainy season in mid-spring, when frogs make a lot of noise during mating. The tears of the weeping babies elicit the tears of the rain spirit Boinayel in late May, when the seven stars of the Pleiades constellation Sirik rise from the sun, representing the seven noisy frogs. From here, we move on to the episode in which Guajayona is confronted by Anakakuya. Guajayona tricks Anakakuya to lean over the gunwale of the canoe to look at a seashell in the water and throws him into the sea to drown. Rubila March notes that Anakakuya's name means flower of the center. This name refers to the constellation group of the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, which includes the North Star. During the night, the two Dipper constellations spin slowly around the North Star, which stands at the center like a pin of a pinwheel. All the other heavenly bodies also revolve around the Dipper group, and the Dipper group take on the aura of a regal entity who dances at the center while everything else appears to dance around it, paying homage to it. But when it's observed from a canoe in the ocean, at a certain time of the year, this circular motion creates an illusion of the Big Dipper sliding down behind the marine horizon, making it look like this regal central entity around whom everybody else was dancing now ends up falling into the ocean and drowning like its human namesake, who attempted to usurp the position of the cacique. The death of Anakakuya is interpreted by Rubio Lamarche as a sacrifice that establishes the North Star in the sky. The North Star is used by navigators to guide them when sailing at night. At this point, Guajayona becomes the first navigator and uses the newly installed North Star to navigate his canoe all the way to the island of Matenino, where the women finally abandon him 
and establish their man-free community in the land of no fathers. After successfully accomplishing his feat of navigation, Guajayona finally must face the consequences of his rebellion. He becomes very ill and spends a great deal of time attempting to wash the sores of his body with water. Finally, he discovers a woman called Guabonito in a place called Guanin, who has separated herself from the rest and is residing by herself near the shore. This woman is a healer. She confines Guajayona in a place called Guanara that Pané describes as a place apart. We in the Cane circle interpret this place apart as a shot lodge in the tradition of the healing Tamascal of Nahual culture, which for centuries have been administered primarily by women healers in Mexico. Guajayona's healing takes the form of a rebirth, and since he is being born as a new person, he assumes a new name, Albeborael. Rubio March interprets this rebirth as an initiation into the role of Bejique, but we see this as his initiation into the role of Cacique. Guabonito regales him with sacred stone pendants and guanin gold, which is typically associated with caciques, not pejiques. Finally, Guajayona returns to the cave community to make amends. This ends the Guajayona cycle. At this point, we prepare to move out to the next ring and begin to follow the Yayal cycle around the ring. But before this move to the next ring, Rubiula March notes that the journey of Guajayona from the home cave to the land of Guanin and then back to the cave reflects the cycle of the planet Venus. The cycle of the planet Venus is based on the interplay between this heavenly body and the sun. During part of that cycle, the cycle of Venus, Venus sets in the western horizon every evening as the evening star behind the sun for a number of days. During this period of days, the sun sets each day in the west and then as the sky grows darker, Venus comes into view following the sun also setting in the west. As time goes by, Venus travels closer and closer to the sun each evening as they both set in the west until the day comes when Venus and the sun are traveling too close together and the planet cannot be seen as they both set in the west at the same time. At this point, Venus has disappeared behind the glare of the sun for a number of days and cannot be seen. During this period of invisibility, the focus of observation travels from west to east because the cycle of Venus will resume in that place next. A bunch of days goes by with Venus setting and rising too close to the sun to be seen. But finally, as expected, Venus emerges again this time rising ahead of the sun in the east every morning for a period of days. This period of days are called morning star risings. After a while, Venus begins to rise so close to the sun in the east that again it goes invisible. This forces the Venus observer to shift his focus back to the west, where the cycle will resume in the form of evening star settings, just as in the beginning. The cycle returns to the beginning after another period of invisibility when Venus begins to set behind the sun as it did at the start. Rubiola March interprets the journey of Guajayona 
as a canoe trip from west to east. It starts with a focus on the western horizon every evening, as the evening star, Venus, sets behind the sun. Then, when Venus becomes invisible for a number of days, the attention travels from west to east in expectation of the morning star risings in the east. This is seen as the journey of Wahayona with his canoe loaded with the women traveling from the cave Kasibahawa in the west to the land of Guanin in the east. After his adventures in Guanin, Wahayona boards his canoe again during the invisible days and sails back to the west in his empty canoe, just in time for the focus to go back there again for the next batch of evening star settings. All right now, now we can move out to the next ring in the sequence. This second ring is the cycle of Yayael, the son of Yaya Lukul. Rubiola March presents the character called Yaya in the Pane narrative as the supreme being. The Yaya at the center of the circular diagram. But we in the Kane circle disagree with that interpretation. We believe that the Great Spirit is indeed called Yaya, but the character in the story of Yayael is not that entity. The Yaya in this story is a human being, not a deity. He has the same name, but he's not the same person anymore than your Chicano next door neighbor called Jesus Rodriguez is the Messiah of the Bible. His name Jesus, Jesus, but he will probably never walk on water or turn water into wine. It is not uncommon in many cultures for human characters to have the same name as deities. An important example of this is the legendary king of Tulum, Quetzalcoatl, who has the same name as the famous deity that manifests itself as a feathered serpent. The human Quetzalcoatl was an important person indeed, but he was not a god. The feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl was a god. They should not be confused one with the other. In Taino tradition, we have given these two characters different second names, so as to avoid confusion. The divine supreme being we call Yaya Guature, meaning Yaya our heaven. The human ancestors of the same name we call Yaya Lokuo, granting him a name taken from the mythology of the Kalinago people who live on the Caribbean island of Dominica. In Rubiula March's circular diagram, the cycle of Yayael begins with the young boy living in his father's house. According to our interpretation of Pane's narrative, the human Yaya settled in a peaceful homestead with his wife and his young son, Yayael, after humanity emerged out of the ancestral cave of Casibahagua. Yaya and his son never got along, and eventually, during a particularly violent confrontation, Yayael was banished from the homestead. Rubiola March interprets this discord between father and son as a manifestation of rebellion on the part of Yayael, and so he marks that in the segment of the Yayael cycle at the left. It is important to note that the position of this rebelliousness of Yayael in the left quadrant of the circle coincides with the positioning of rebelliousness for Guajayona in the previous cycle that we just finished a little while ago. The rebelliousness of Yayael results in his banishment from his father's house for a period of four months. Rubiola March records that episode of the story with an annotation on the lower left-hand quadrant of Yayael's circle. The trek around the circle continues down to the extreme bottom, at which point Rubiola March notes that elsewhere in the community a group of quadruplets is born via cesarean section from the womb of Itibacaobaba. Since she dies in childbirth, Rubiola March simply notes that the four boys are extracted from her belly. This is, of course, the four brothers with Deminan as their leader. But this is not their cycle yet. They will come of age later in the third cycle. The circular movement continues on its way around the Yayel cycle. And finally, the boy is killed by his father in another violent altercation. Yaya dismembers the dead boy's body and places the bones in a gourd for burial. Rubiola March makes note of that event in the bottom right-hand quadrant of the circle that reads, mutilated hero. The journey around the circle of Yayael continues to the extreme right-hand quadrant, where the boy's bones turn into seawater and fish swimming around inside the hanging gourd. This water eventually will be spilled by Deminan, creating the great flood and inhabiting the ocean with fish. 
Robiu Lamarch makes a note of this by marking this quadrant with the words creation, fish, and flooding. Finally, the cycle of Yayael is concluded, and we are ready to jump out to the third circle, the cycle of Deminan. The cycle of the Minan begins with the birth of the quadruplets from the belly of Itiba Kahubaba, who dies in childbirth as her four sons are cut out of her womb. Robiula March makes note of this episode by marking the very top quadrant of the Deminan cycle with the words Itiba Kahubaba, Mother Earth, acknowledging that Itiba is a manifestation of Akabe. As we move around the circle of the Deminan cycle, we arrive at the extreme left-hand quadrant, where the rebellion usually takes place. Robiula March notes in this place that the quadruplets are experiencing their adventures in a noisy, boisterous manner. We conclude that their irreverence for their elders and the rudeness with which the four boys confront them is a manifestation of their rebellion against the norms of Taino society. At the extreme bottom quadrant of the Deminan cycle, we arrive at the episode in which Deminan enters the home of Yayalokuo, accompanied by his brothers, and takes down the gourd that contains the fish. Trubula March notes this episode with the words, hanging gourd, magic uterus, acknowledging the fact that to the ancient Tainos, the hanging gourd that contained the remains of their dead relatives was a metaphor for the womb of Atabe in Kwaibai, where the souls of the ancestors dwell. The notation Injured Hero in the lower right hand quadrant of the Minan cycle presages the painful rupture on the back of the Minan that will allow for the birth of Kaguana, the turtle woman, later in the cycle. The extreme right-hand quadrant of this cycle, Rubiula March notes, Honel Silence, which makes reference to a mute character in the Deminan cycle who is confronted by the quadruplets on their way to Bayamanaka's home. This silent character stands in complementary contrast with the manifestation of noise on the opposite side of the circle. At this point in the cycle, the four boys enter Yaya Lokuo's home and take down the gourd. Upon hearing Yaya's return, they hastily exit the hut, dropping the gourd and breaking it, whereupon the water flows out, flooding the low places and spreading fish all over the oceans. Robiola March memorializes this episode with the words, creation, fish, flooding. Robiola March's research has demonstrated that the episode of the broken gourd and the scattering of the fish is linked to a widespread mythical theme shared by several related indigenous cultures, in which there is a mention of flooding and fish associated with the veneration of the dead. He notes that there is evidence that indicates that the ancient Tainos celebrated special ceremonies for the dead in the fall, just about late October, when three species of fish made their mating runs up the rivers and streams of the Caribbean islands. These fish were the snooks, the mullets, and the tarpons, and this annual event was usually foreshadowed by the rise of the constellation Orion. At this point in the Deminan cycle, we arrive at the episode of Bayamanaco. The old medicine man is inhaling cohoba powder just before he is interrupted by the irreverent youths who barge into his home uninvited. He pauses just long enough to blow a wad of cohoba impregnated mucus on Deminan's back. Rubiula March memorializes this episode with the words, Cohoba Bayamanaco. This is the end of the third and final mythic cycle. At this point, we jump out to the next ring in the diagram. This ring is dedicated to important complementary opposites that sit on opposing sides of the ring. The themes of above and inside at the top of the circle are paired with the complementary opposites below 
and outside at the bottom. The positive themes of creation and balance are associated with a set of twin statues maintained in the sacred cave of Iguana Buena. These are the statues of the rainy weather spirit Buenayel and the dry weather spirit Marohu. There is a sense of control and balance linked to these statues because the Tainos would tie the hands of the rainy weather image and untie the hands of the dry weather image when they wanted dry weather, and vice versa when they wanted rain. All of this is reflected in the annotation that Ruby on the March marks at the upper left hand quadrant of the circle. By contrast, in the opposite side of the circle, in the lower right hand quadrant, the spirits alluded to there represent the exact opposite. Guabansesh is the deity of totally uncontrollable catastrophic natural manifestations. Rubiola March notes the words hurricane season along with the words destruction and imbalance. In the extreme left-hand quadrant, Rubiula March makes a reference to human rebellion associated to the three instances of rebellion that occur on that side of the circle in the three mythic cycles. On the opposite side of the hoop, he references the rebellion of nature. At this point, we jump out to the next ring. This ring expresses the seasons. We start at the lower left-hand quadrant with the spring season and the beginning of the rains, which Rubiula March contends was the beginning of the year for the ancient Taino. In the extreme lower quadrant of the Circle of Seasons, Robiula March records the name of the summer solstice. Then he continues around the circle to the maize harvest in late summer, early fall. He follows that with a notation in the lower right-hand quadrant of the hurricane season, which is in full swing during the late summer, early fall. In keeping with this constant focus on complementary opposites, Robiula March records a notation of the dry season above in a position of the circle directly opposite to the wet hurricane season below. Continuing around the seasons, Robiula March now takes us to the fall equinox in the extreme right-hand quadrant of the seasonal circle. And again, he contrasts it with the opposite spring equinox on the other side of the circle. He follows this with the fall maize crop that is cultivated in the second rainy season. That is followed by the tobacco harvest. At this point, Robiola March takes us up to the top of the season cycle where he notes the winter solstice, the start of the dry season. We continue around the circle in the dry season to the point where the ancient farmers began the process of slash and burn, cutting down trees and brush to clear the fields and then burning them to create fertilizing ash that would be mixed into the soil to enrich it. This process of field preparation, of course, takes place during the winter dry season. We now arrive at the spring equinox in March, which we already visited earlier in opposition to the fall equinox, and that is followed quickly by the beginning of the rains in late May, which takes us right back to the start of the season's cycle.
This finally takes us out to the last ring of the diagram, the outer ring. This ring is the one that contains Yokahu at the top in the heavens and Atabe below as the Earth Mother. It also contains the sacred directions of west on the left and east on the right. These are all concepts that we already visited earlier. The complexity of the Rubiola March Circle Cosmogram proves the care and attention that this brilliant researcher has dedicated to the study of these important elements of our ancestral culture. And we in the Kane Circle feel deeply indebted to this brother for all the work that he did to bring it to fruition. As we already said earlier, the differences that we found between our own conception of Taino cosmology and his conception of Taino cosmology cannot obscure the fact that we could not be where we are in our level of understanding if it were not for his work. Hahom Sebastian Robiu Lamarche.